Hello, everybody. My name is Fionn. How are you doing today? Good. <laughs> Excellent. That's what, I that's what I love to hear. Um, so, um, I'm speaking all the way from the Netherlands here. More of that in a minute. So um, if at any point you can't hear me or there's something wrong, don't, don't hesitate to let me know. I want you to grasp every little word I have to say to you oh. here this morning. Um, yeah, so on your screen right now, there's a big, long title of a project that I used um, for, or the title I used for my project, which I did for the Google Global Science Fair. So the Google Global Science Fair is a science fair which anybody can enter as long as you've got an internet connection. You do a project, it can be small, little research project, or something maybe more, more um, interesting, like maybe what I do, but you can enter anything. It's just based on a scientific method. You carry out a method, research something, maybe do a couple of experiments, and then summarize your results. You can enter online. I'm not quite sure when the next round will be opening, but I think it's a really, really interesting experience for all of you where you can really show and showcase your ideas and win some amazing prizes. So I'm going to move on to the next slide here. So just the next slide. And you can see where I come from. So it's probably quite different to, to where you're watching this. But this is Ireland, the coastline of Ireland, which is just a beautiful area for kayaking, water sports, and I'm always close to the water. And it might look very clean, but we've got a big problem on our coastline, and that is plastic pollution. Plastics are washing up on our shores, and it's making it increasingly um, more and more unsightly to be at the beach, but also a problem because we see dead animals. We see animals that have died as a consequence of plastic pollution. These large plastics in the water can break down into much, much smaller plastics, and these small plastics can bioaccumulate, which means that fish eat these plastics, they then get stuck in the, the intestines of the fish. They can cause problems to the fish, or they can even go into the flesh of the fish. And that means if you eat a fish containing plastics, you're eating plastic. Plastics have softeners and a lot of nasty chemicals in them, which can cause a lot of, I guess, not very nice things like um, cancers and Alzheimer's disease. So because of that, it's really a priority for us to remove these from water. So on the next slide, you can see some uh, small plastic particles on my thumb. So this is how small they are. These are microplastics. They're less than a couple of millimeters in size, and they can go down into nanometers of size, like less than the thickness of a hair. And they're coming from everywhere, from the cars that drive on our roads to washing houses to a lot of different things. So on the next slide, you can see just the sources of microplastics in the marine environment in Ireland. I'm sure this is very similar to any other country around the world. You can see the largest source in blue on the graph is car tires. Then we have boat maintenance, washing paint off houses, um, dumping, cosmetics. Yeah, even your toothpaste will have tiny plastic particles in it um, to help wash your teeth. Of course, all of these are going into our waste wars and ultimately the sea. So it's a really big priority for us to remove these from water. So I am just a normal uh, student. I'm a normal person who, who, I guess, likes researching things. I was going to high school, and I learned about a couple of concepts to, to do with, um, I guess, extraction processes in chemistry and things like that. One of them is due to polarity. And polarity is basically when you, when you have something charged and not charged. And in chemistry, likes attract likes, which means charged things attract charged things, and not really charged things don't really attract charged things. So non-polar things attract polar or non-polar things, and polar things attract polar things. So I was thinking about this in the back of my mind. While this was also happening, I was playing with some really cool liquids called ferrofluids. Now, ferrofluids are magnetic liquids, which means that if you bring magnets close to the liquid, they uh, will attract the liquid. It's quite cool stuff. I recommend you check out some ferrofluids. Um, and you'll see some later in my, my slides. But ferrofluids are really, really useful um, if you're, you're doing things physics related. But nobody really had the idea of associating them with chemistry with extraction processes. So I think that in my project, I explored things creatively. And all of you out there have a creative mind. As we grow older, I feel like we don't get so creative. We start dumbing down our mind. But at your age, I think that you all have the capacity to solve some of our world's problems just by using 
cool links between different areas of science and different things you have learned. So don't underestimate your thinking cells just yet. So what I did was I thought, well, maybe I could try adding some oil to water and see if plastics stick to oil. So I got some vegetable oil. Here you can see some vegetable oil. And then I decided to make some plastics, microplastics. So on my next slide, you can see me making some microplastics. This is quite a simple process. Basically, what I did was just sand some plastic bottles. And you can see me collecting the microplastic particles in the trough below. My idea was to artificially contaminate water with plastics and then add oil and magnetite powder. And like that, um, maybe see if I could remove the plastics from water. So in the next slide, you can see, um, I guess, my first test of this extraction process. So I start by adding some plastics to water, artificially contaminating it. You can see that this water is pretty dirty water now with plastics. Then I add vegetable oil, and here I've got a bottle. It's just regular vegetable oil. It could be any light oil. And then I add magnetite powder. This is just rust powder. This is found on every beach on the planet. This is completely not toxic or not harmful. And together, this makes a magnetic liquid, which binds wow. to the plastic particles. If I bring in a magnet, you can see that I can attract things pretty cool. Like, I think actually this should be included in those, those you know, um, strangely satisfying YouTube videos or something like that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's quite an effective process, at least visually. And um, what I then decided to do was test this, and that posed a huge, big problem. So I live really, really far away from the lab. Even though I'm in Europe, even though everybody says that's the hotspot, I'm in Ireland, and that is pretty remote. Like, it would take me about four to five hours drive from my home to get to the nearest lab. So if I wanted to test how to use my equipment or how, to, uh, how efficient my method was, I would have to build my own equipment. So that's exactly what I did. And you can see that on the next slide. <laughs> so I got working. I used Lego string, lots of different bits and pieces, and an old webcam, and uh, yeah, a lot of agonizing hours of, of building things and trying out different things. And like that, I was able to, um, I guess, try out things, tinker with science, and I was trying to build something called a spectrometer. Basically, a spectrometer shines light through a sample of water, and then it analyzes the light that comes back to the other side. From this, we almost get a fingerprint of what's in the water, and we can see what colors of the light are absorbed by the water. By like this, we can then analyze um, to see what's in the water. And I then made the software to analyze this. And like that, it would figure out exactly how much plastic was in the water. So on the next slide, you can see some prototypes for encounters. And a lot of them didn't work. You're all going to encounter some problem in your life where sometimes your first attempt won't work. You can see some were made of Lego, some were cardboard, some were other things. And I just think it's really important to keep on trying. Um, I guess instead of seeing something like this as a failure, you see it as another way that you've found that doesn't work. And I think that's something you should adopt straight away, that uh, instead of seeing things as failures, just think of them as another attempt at something. And you, I guess you know another way that doesn't work. Um, so I continue building. And on my next slide, we can see a video of my final spectrometer. It had a webcam and a diffraction ray. It basically split the light into its constituents colors. Then it shines light through a sample, and it analyzes it through a tiny little microcontroller here called an Arduino. If you're into coding or into computer science, get yourself an Arduino. They're really, really cheap little microcontrollers, and you can do a whole load of interesting and cool experiments and things like that. I then get something which you can see on the screen now, which is a spectrum. It shows um, on the bottom scale the, uh, the wavelength of the light, or what color the light is. So at the very bottom, we've got um, reds, and then it goes, goes higher to, to blue and, and violets and things like that. And on the side, on the vertical axis, you can see intensity. That intensity is how bright it was at that light. On the next slide, you can see some more cells. Um, and here we can see how the intensities vary with the concentration of plastics in water. And like this, I was able to very easily figure out how many plastics were in my water using a kind of complicated law, which I won't go into today, but it's called the beer lambert law. Basically, it says that the plastic concentration is proportional to the amount of light absorbed and a given wavelength. 
And below you can see um, a picture of the spectrum of light, just as I would use it. So it shows that just with a little bit of Lego building, a little bit of woodwork, you can actually really easily build something that is an effective, interesting, and very useful uh, method for extracting or measuring microplastics in water. I then decided to test this on sample, so I tested it a couple of thousand times. It was really, really accurate. I got high correlation coefficients for my lines, and from that, I decided that it was probably an accurate method. But me as being a scientist, I like to question things, so I didn't entirely trust myself. I decided that I would build something else. So on the next slide, you can see another piece of kit that I built, um, which is a microscope. This is a very simple digital microscope. Um, which basically takes a, a very close up picture um, of the uh, very very close up picture of the plastics in the water. Um, this very close up picture um, is then used before and after extraction, and you can see the difference in the two uh, um, upper pictures on your screen right now. I also used Adobe Photoshop to count exactly the number of pixels covered in plastic, and from that, um, I was really easily able to, I guess, figure out how efficient my method was. Because I'm a lazy person, um, so because of that, I did not want to count all the bits of plastic on my screen at any given time, and particularly for thousands of samples. So I got the computer to calculate for me the percentage decrease in plastics before and after extraction. So my next slide, you can see some results. This might look like a daunting bar chart to you, but I hope you'll make some sense of it. And basically, on the bar chart, you can see lots of vertical bars. The blue ones are for the results from spectroscopy or using my home-built spectrometer. And the red ones are from my microscope, using my home-built microscope. And you can see that um, there's also these little kind of bar-shaped things on the very top of the bars. That's just the error, or that's how much my results deviated from the average. The horizontal line going across the page, the orange one with the little arrow pointing to it, is my hypothesis how uh, likely um, I, or uh, this is what I predicted to be the um, percentage decrease in plastics just from visual observations. And you can see that this hypothesis was indeed met by all of my plastics on average, and the easiest to extract plastics were washing machine fibers. Those come from when you wash clothes, the little fibers from your clothes can fall off, and those are plastics that go into our wastewater. And it was really interesting to me that those were the easiest to extract. In fact, it's due to their surface areas, and because of this, I think that this could be a method that could be employed in a lot of different wastewater treatment environments, um, both on the highly commercial scale, but also the domestic scale. It's a very simple method, as you saw. It's not polluting to the environment. And because of this, I really, really do hope that I can develop this further. I'm currently working with many other teams. On my next slide, you can see just the overall extraction result, which is 87%. Plus or minus 1.1%. I decided to dedicate a whole slide just to this beautiful number because this is higher than the extraction rates from many other processes. And in fact, the only other really valid process is filtration. But of course, filtration is not good because when you do filtration, um, it takes a long time and you can't do it with organic materials mixed in, which would happen in, for instance, samples like wastewater. So on my next slide, you can see some wastewater organic materials test. Here I used pond water and added plastics to it. Then I used UV light. Um, and you can see just, just above, the UV light makes plastics go white. So you can see even before and after extraction, I'm still getting extraction without removing the organic material, which means that hopefully this method can be employed in organic material water as well, rivers, and ultimately the sea as well. Um, what I'm looking at is um, to build a filtration system that can be built into shipping so then it can be used on a wide uh, variety of places. So now it's your time to ask some questions. I tried to keep my presentation short and snappy because um, I know from watching presentations you're probably overwhelmed by what you see. But here's just a couple of questions to get you started. If you have any other questions, uh, I've got my contact details after this on screen as well. But um, I'm interested to see uh, or hear what you come up with. 